here, gang? Oh, it's a busy, busy, busy week. I have a couple of Gibsons to work on here. Quite different guitars in a lot of respects. One is a 1962 LG-1. The other is a 1974 or 5 Hummingbird. Both very attractive, good sounding guitars. So what do they need? Bridges and neck resets. Bridges? Yeah. The Hummingbirds here has been cut down in the past to get a little more room to lower the saddle, and it's really quite low. So if we're going to do a neck reset on it, we might as well bring this back up close to the factory spec while we're at it, so we can bolster the voice of the instrument and get as much out of it as we can. The LG is something entirely different. Some of you are probably nodding your head, kind of smirking right now, because you know what's coming up. This is from a short-lived period, thankfully, when Gibson decided to use plastic bridges. It was the early to mid-60s. All the student models, like the B25 or the LGO or LG1 like this, they had this kind of bridge with a standard saddle in it. Uh, J45s, 50s, and Hummingbirds had the wide ceramic adjustable saddle, but they also had plastic bridges. This is one rare instance in the guitar world where virtually everyone agrees. Originality in this case can go take a hike, because although there might be a few decent sounding guitars with these on them, in virtually every case they sound better when swapped out for the traditional wood bridge. Nobody gets offended when they see that it's been replaced. Usually they're happy, because if they're buying it, it's already been done and they don't have to be the one who pays for it. These were made in large numbers, and they remain one of the most affordable ways to get into the vintage Gibson market. A Gibson flat top from the 40s or 50s is usually out of reach for most players now, but you can still pick up one of these for less than the cost of a decent used car. Ladder bracing can cause some issues. They're a little more prone to the top deforming, as opposed to an X-brace, and they often develop a wavy thing around the sound hole. The player has secured a replacement bridge, which is supposed to be a direct replacement. We shall see. Uh, I'm going to have to measure this pretty carefully to see how accurate it is in terms of the saddle placement and string-to-string -string spacing and that kind of thing. Um, just looking at it, I can tell that this saddle is too narrow relative to what Gibson was using in the 60s. We should measure that. Uh, this is going to be 125 thousandths. Yeah. And this, 110, 115, 110. So, yeah, at the very least, I'm going to be routing this slot bigger, and we'll use something other than a plastic saddle. I'm just going to check the basic setup numbers here so we have a benchmark. On the LG, we've got around 964 ths on the base side, and just about the same on the treble. Hummingbird is around 864 ths and about 6 on the treble. So not quite as bad. Yeah, the action's okay, but if you see what's going on on the bridge here, there's no downward pressure on the saddle, and it has been planed, as I mentioned, very low. It's less than a quarter of an inch, just over three sixteenths at the front edge here. The relief is a little bit high at around fifteen thousandths, so we should give the truss rod a bit of an adjustment as well. Hey, the truss rod nut looks like it's in pretty good shape. It's been adjusted at least once. Um, I've been told that this guitar spent the better part of 30 years in a cottage in the area of the French River, which is a lovely spot, kind of middle Ontario, where I've been canoeing a couple of times, but it was unheated. So this thing was subjected to sub-zero temperatures every year for 30 years. It's in pretty good shape, considering. Relief on the LG is actually pretty good at around nine thousandths which is nice because this truss rod nut has seen some use. It's been a bit rounded off there, and you can see that there's some threads exposed past the end of it, which generally means that it's been snugged up pretty tight over the years. So, I'm not going to adjust it right now. I'll just check and make sure that it's not completely stripped out. Yeah, that's fine. Something I talk about often on these reset videos is checking out the plane of the fingerboard relative to the front of the bridge, with and without strings. Uh, someone asked about that. What I'm doing is measuring where the straight edge projects with and without tension because the soundboard will often distort or sink slightly and that varies from guitar to guitar. 
but if I measure it now, I can account for that sinkage when I'm changing the neck angle. In a lot of tutorials, we were told that the neck should line up with the top of the bridge. And in many situations, yes, that's fine. But if we've got a more flexible top, and some ladder brace guitars tend to be more flexible, it can move down, say, maybe a 32nd of an inch, 0.7 millimeters. If we don't account for it, we could lose a lot of saddle height trying to dial in the action. There are fancy dial indicator devices on the market that span the lower bout and they measure what goes on back here behind the bridge. But this is pretty low tech and easy and repeatable. So that's the way I do it. See with string tension on and measuring from the underside of the straight edge to the top surface of the soundboard at the front of the bridge, I got around four millimeters. Now, with all the string tension taken off, these are completely slack, uh, it's now around five. That means that the guitar folds up by about a millimeter, um, which is something I'll account for. When it comes time to to the final adjustments of the neck, I will overshoot by about a millimeter so that when things start to compress again, I'll end up with the saddle height that I want. This is an interesting and slightly unnatural situation where projecting the straight edge comes basically ideal. It's on top of the front edge of the bridge here. But what's going on is it's been carved downwards towards the front at an angle so that these bridge pins and the holes where the strings are emerging are actually higher than the top of the saddle itself. So this is never going to function the way we want it to. We could, you know, cut this saddle down further even, but that would just exacerbate the problem. I removed the bridges in my usual way. This is a silicone heat mat. Different glues were used on these guitars. The Hummingbird has sort of this sticky white glue that Gibson was using in the 70s. It's pretty good stuff. Um, like the bridges don't seem to come off very frequently with this glue. And you're about to see, it's kind of like pizza mozzarella. It's the same for the fingerboard extensions. I'm using my sealing iron here. And while the 15th frets are still hot, I'll remove those. I'll drill the access holes for my heat probes. You can see I found the void quite readily on this guitar. Gibson sprayed the finish after the neck was joined to the body. This leaves a buildup in the corner there, which has to be cut through with a very sharp blade. Otherwise, you could do serious damage to the finish if you were trying to push the neck off. It might have been nice if Gibson had used the same nut size as the ones that are on their truss rods. But no, they appear to be quarter inch rather than five sixteenths. This is held in place with the little plastic studs that accept the screws. And here we can get a look at the underside of an injection molded bridge. There's really not much material there. Okay, the replacement bridge seems to be a little bit wider and actually substantially longer by about two and a half millimeters. Here's where things get a little interesting, even accounting for the different widths of saddle. It looks like the replacement is slightly forward of the original. So, you know, I'll check and see where it ends up after it's glued on, but when I go to route the saddle slot a little bit wider so it matches up with the original, I should remember to put that extra route material on the side towards the pins. Uh, that should get us in the right place, hopefully. Got a nice blank for the Hummingbird. It's about the right size. And it's quarter sawn. Be careful. If you're going to make a bridge, quarter sawn material is the way to go. Because even if it's really well seasoned, flat sawn bridges sometimes have a tendency to cup upwards when they're on the guitar, and that can cause problems. Uh, I've got some footage of a Larravee that shows it. This is a P01, which is a lovely um, 12 fret model, sort of like a Martin O size guitar. Nice little guitar. There's some action issues. Um, the saddle height has to come down. I'm told that there's a shim in the saddle, 
but to my mind it looks like someone has glued the saddle in place. You can use hide glue to glue in a through saddle in certain vintage guitars because it's normal, but this kind of saddle does not need to be glued in. If it does, there's something wrong. I decided to see if the Graftec Tusk Resin would hold up under enough heat to soften the glue. The rear corners of the bridge were loose from the top, warped upwards actually, and could not be pressed down. So off comes the bridge. Okay, I've never seen one quite like this before. The amount of lip here is kind of extreme. Like it's it's in oh I'm gonna say probably five thousands. Let me get you up close. So the edges of this bridge weren't ever in fact glued down and could allow for the warpage to start. So I scored around the entire bridge, cut away the offending material, scraped it, and here I'm using self-adhesive sandpaper in the footprint to sand the bridge base to shape. It can take a while to get a good fit. I sand and scrape and sand and scrape. The slot varies a lot in width, uh, by as much as 12 thousandths of an inch in the center versus the ends. And at that point, it's actually wider than any standard saddle blank you would buy. Um, the slot also seems to be pitched forward slightly, um, which could be just bridge rotation. The whole bridge is actually kind of warped slightly. So I'm thinking probably the best thing to do is just plug this and recut the slot. It'll be quicker and easier and cleaner than any other option. So I'll get out the ebony. I'm cutting the plug to length, then creating the radius on the ends, starting with a chisel, and then a file. Working it down carefully so that there's a nice snug fit. I'll glue this in, plane it off, sand the top. Here's where I'm correcting the upwards warp, uh, trying to get rid of you know, the undulating surface on the top and the wing. With a new saddle slot, I can get back to this setup. So we'll leave this guitar behind and get back to the Gibsons. Planning a blank for the hummingbird. This is fun work. I'll scribe the outline from the original bridge. Drill some holes for the bridge pins. Cut the thing to size and sand the profile. There we are. One thing to consider, if you're crazy like me and have to do two of these things at the same time from different decades, is to measure and make sure that you have the right bridge that you're working from, because if you weren't careful you could turn this around and get the pins on the wrong side. These bridges are virtually identical, it's just at some point they decided they didn't want the reverse belly anymore and wanted to go with the old-fashioned Martin style. I got scared there for a second and had to think about it. Well, I was just getting into taking the neck off the LG, and it seems that one of my foam cutters has decided it wants to retire. After nine resets, it probably doesn't owe me much. I have another one on order, which is supposed to come tomorrow. It's one of the inexpensive Chinese versions. It's about half the price. I, I mean, it's no big deal. I have several other means at my disposal to take the neck off, obviously. I just want to know if the cheap ones work well. The interior shots on both of these guitars show a bunch of chewed up damage on the bridge plate where the ball ends of the strings have pulled up into them. You can see the splintery surface around the holes, and this is also a good shot of the double X bracing. Pretty beefy stuff in the Hummingbird. This is fairly common because the Gibson bridge plates in the 60s and 70s are frequently made of a plywood sort of material that seems to be much softer than the standard maple or rosewood used for this. And, you know, the plates themselves are still intact for the most part, except for the area of the pinholes. Um, they're not cracked all the way through the plate, um, which I guess is one of the benefits of the plywood. They still have some structural integrity. And that's a good thing, because getting the bridge plates out of both of these models is really tough. Especially that double X design, because it's a diamond here. The plate is completely surrounded by braces. 
It's a very long job because there's not much access to get a knife in there. You basically have to start cutting parts and it's... Eh, don't like to think about it. Um, it's similar with the ladder bracing too. The black electrical tape was an effort to damp out metallic ringing between the bolt and the washers, I think. Because you've got two braces on either side of the plate, very close. And again, there's not much access to get the knife in there. Um, just one of the things with ladder bracing. I mean, harmonies are a little bit easier. There's generally some space between uh, the back of the bridge plate and the brace there so I can get in, but in this case you're rubbing right up against the brace. In terms of weight, these are very light. It's hard maple, but they don't add a whole lot of mass to the soundboard. Um, frankly, I think they might actually make things sound better because you've got a firmer connection for the ball end and probably better string energy transfer, but uh, certainly it's not going to affect the tone of the guitar very much. I'm cutting some spruce plugs to fill the bolt holes in the LG. Don't have to worry about damage from the saw here because the whole surface is going to get scraped. On the Hummingbird Bridge, I'm going to sand it and get the profile the way I like it. Just checking out the saddle placement here. Just a little bit short on the high E string. And just about right for the base side. So, yeah, routing that saddle slot a little bit wider is going to help me because I need some extra compensation for the high E. Judging from the previous outline, the original bridge was not really put on at a perfect right angle to the center line, which is okay, I guess. Uh, the good thing is they didn't scrape the finish off at all under these bridges, so it's fine. I don't have a big glaring outline of white wood. So I can cant it slightly and get the intonation as close as I can. So I'll scrape all that lacquer off. And, oh, this procedure again. Try doing this three times in a week. You'll learn something about yourself. See? I'm told if you do this for 10,000 hours, you can become an expert. I like my Motley array of clamps. Each has a special beauty, all its own. The inexpensive foam cutter arrived. It feels inexpensive. And this is relative, because the good ones don't cost that much more. It doesn't seem to get as hot as the older one. And the other thing is, the barrel is significantly larger diameter. It's about two millimeters, around 80 thousandths. That's not an issue with these wide Gibson frets, but it would be more difficult to hide under the ones you would find on a vintage Martin, say. So I put in an order with the Hot Knife Foam Factory. I'll pay for the quality. It's a US company, and they seem to back their products well, so I'm happy with them. The LG was really combative. That's because there was a segment of binding trapped on the face of the heel. It was held in place there between a lip of the top wood and... Okay, that's interesting and something to take note of. Rather than against the pin surface of the dovetail here, there's a shim that's hard up against the end of the neck, and it's tapered from thickest near the fingerboard down to nothing at the end of the tail. It's glued on there, and this is part of the reason it was difficult to remove. Ooh, this is going to make fitting probably a lot more difficult. So I clamped the binding back down and secured it with some glue. I scraped the old glue off and lightly relieved the face of the heel near its ends so there'd be less to sand off when I'm doing the sandpaper pulls. Here's the reason for that weird shim. Somehow it looks like the side was cut right through to the block at an angle, almost as if the dovetail jig was misaligned for its first pass or something. Maybe they inserted the shim to take up space. Here's the familiar task of tipping the neck back by progressively sanding the heel. More routing. Give the bridge a coat of oil. Drill out the pinholes. Ream them to size for the pins. Some things you just need to fix. There was a fingerboard crack on the LG here that was previously glued. 
unfortunately the sound hole edge didn't go back into perfect alignment and it's missing this chunk of top wood. So I'm going to put a cleat under it for extra insurance and I'll inlay a bit of spruce because it's the kind of thing that if you were to catch a pick in it you could really do some damage. I'll trace the outline of the sound hole on the cleat, cut it out, glue it in, check to make sure it's aligned properly. And then I cut a piece of spruce to fit the void. Trim that back. Then I'll sand it and even out the rim of the sound hole a little bit. There are two back braces here that are loose at certain points, which isn't good. We have to fix that. Bouncy. I used a whole lot of props. I'm marking the intonation points on the hummingbird here. And before I route, I have to even out the surface of the top here with a whole bunch of shims because the hummingbird pickguard is very thick. If I didn't, the saddle slot would slope dramatically. Polishing, polishing, polishing. These are the super low and wide 70s frets. And that little bit of wear there from the B-string, we're just gonna leave that alone because there's really not too much height if we wanted to go dressing these down. It's not too bad anyway. Okay, I think that's enough for one video. There's still a little bit of touch-up work to do here and there, but uh, we got reasonable saddle height and very good action. Just over 5 64ths on the bass, 4 on the treble. To be honest, I'm not quite as happy with the LG. I think there's some more work to do on this one, because under full string tension, the amount of dip in the top there is really quite excessive. The bridge is rolling forward, so I'm going to add a couple of sound hole braces, which you've seen me do before, um, as there aren't any in this guitar. And that should take care of some of it. And this one might actually be a good candidate for a bridge doctor. The action is okay now, but I don't trust what's going on with this top. Kind of don't want to let it go home like this. Mm -hmm.